Hello and welcome to a new edition of the JavaScript SEO Office Hours. Uh, today I have 13 people here in the Hangouts. We have a few questions on YouTube, so stay tuned for um, this episode, so to speak. I'm not even sure if this is an episode. I think it's like an episodical thing. It's a series of Hangouts, but I'm never sure if it's like an edition or an episode or what would I call it. Anyway, whatever. I'm digressing. Um, there is a bunch of questions on YouTube. Let's start with the YouTube question before we go into the audience questions. So showing different content for an existing user based on the JS cookies, will this hurt my SEO? For example, a user is new. For this user, we should we show what? We show one promotion like get started, and user B is already an existing user. For this user, we show the latest promotions. Does this impact my SEO? Um, kind of, yes, it does. I mean, it doesn't really, but it kind of does in the sense of that Googlebot does not run uh, with set cookies. So we would only see the content that a new user would see. I would suggest to have um, different landing pages uh, and then actually expose both of these uh, through links to Googlebot so people can also see the latest promotions if you care about that. Um, and that would allow you to show the same content to both users and Googlebot, just you would move the people to different uh, starting URLs, for instance. You would redirect people if a cookie is present. That is fine. That wouldn't hurt your SEO, per se. Can a JavaScript front-end technology change cause a drop in Google ranking? We have a few million visitors per month and follow Google guidelines. When we switched from Angular and PHP, so server-side rendering, to Vue and Nuxt with server-side rendering, uh, we lost rankings immediately, about minus 20% traffic. Our overhaul lighthouse score went from 40 to 85. So do you think it's possible for a site to drop because of a change in JavaScript? Bonus info, we did notice that other sites had been hacked and that the hackers have made subfolders on these pages uh, with our entire site copied and smart canonicals to spam shop pages. I'm not sure what smart canonicals are, but OK. Uh, could it be that because of the timing of this, Google has considered um, some of the hacked sites as the true source of the content that belongs to us as Google has to understand our new JavaScript? And if so, what to do? Examples of sites in case uh, these are helpful. These are helpful, but I'm not sure if I have the time to look at them right now. Um, generally speaking, a switch in technology should not mean that much of a change in, uh, in pretty much anything except for I'm guessing you didn't just change technology. You probably also changed maybe site structure, or maybe you changed uh, the way that your content was presented. If you made changes uh, above the threshold of where technology is serving, we don't really care about the technology that runs. Um, and, uh, and we care about the content. So if you have made changes to the way that you present the content, that would mean that we would have to take time to actually re understand things. Uh, it could coincide with the other hacks that we're trying to like uh, take content away. You can check if we consider your pages canonical for the content that you produce. Um, so that's something that I would I would double check. And uh, ranking can always change a little bit. There's things happening on the web all the time. So ranking changes are not necessarily something that comes from the technology that you choose, but other factors might be uh, part of that as well. Um, it could be that it was an update to the algorithms. Ranking isn't really my, my area of expertise. Um, but generally speaking, assuming that all the content is visible and present in the rendered HTML, and the web website apparently got faster, um, I wouldn't expect that to be the, the source of ranking changes. It could be these hacked websites. It could be that just the way that you represent your content has changed fundamentally, and that we need time to reprocess it. Um, that's also the same thing with like people are redoing their sites, revamping their sites, changing the way that the content looks like and is presented to the user. And then they see changes like this. Because fundamentally, you have created a new website. If you really just change the underlying technology and everything else, the way that you show the content and the, the, um, the URLs and all that stayed the same, then um, we wouldn't have like seen that much of a difference. Um, then there's a question. Hi, Martin. I am helping a nonprofit, and I'm afraid that the content in a very important part of the website is not indexable because it's made up of widgets loaded by scripts. 
will you be able to confirm and maybe have some tips on how they could add the content differently to make sure it's indexed by the, by the bots? Well, what you're saying is you're afraid that, which means you're not probably not sure that this is actually a problem. Uh, content loaded by scripts and widgets is not exactly an issue per se. Um, I would plug this URL into any of the testing tools, uh, be it the URL inspection tool, uh, be it the uh, mobile-friendly test, the rich results test, and look at the rendered HTML. If the content that you care about in this section of the page is present in the rendered HTML, then there's nothing to worry about. If it isn't, then you would have to investigate why it isn't in the rendered HTML. Uh, there's a follow-up question, a critical question on the first question, the first question being the one um, regarding showing different content based on cookies. How about websites where new users, including Googlebot, are shown an HTML site, but logged in users uh, are shown a JavaScript homepage with, uh, without any textual content at all? Um, Per se, what happens once you logged in is, is not something that search engines really care for. Uh, I mean, do what you feel is right. We can't see things behind the login to begin with. Um, so I wouldn't worry about that, to be honest. For SEO reasons, anything behind the login is invisible to us. You're welcome. I think it's time to take a few questions from the audience. Anyone has a question today? Yes, uh, hi Martin. Uh, hi Christian. I, I would like uh, I would like to start uh, because I have uh, two questions, but um, maybe the first one. Um, it's from a client of mine, and I only have it in German, so I, I try to translate it. You can um, actually ask the question in German hypothetically, and, and I'll happily answer it in English. But I think yeah, if you can translate it, that would be fantastic for the the audience. Yes, yes, I will try. So uh, it's about uh, it's about a single page application. And um, uh, it's uh, under a, a domain which is redirected to the uh, www domain, mm -hmm. and uh, this causes problems with end users who have uh, a bookmark to the non www domain. Um, it's uh, causing a corp um, c o r b uh, error mm. because the service worker who uh, delivers uh, pages from the cache uh, for the database content um, uh, points to the um, to the other uh, domain uh, which is uh, with www and mm -hmm. um, yeah this is causing these uh, corp problems and the question would be um, is it okay to redirect um, to the www only if the user agent is googlebot or a crawler and uh, uh, show the non www uh, version for for the um, for the normal uh, page visit visitors. So, just making sure that I, that was like a lot and yeah. it's early. Um, you have a non dub 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 and you have a dub yeah. dub dub domain. And yeah. the problem is with people who bookmark the non dub dub dub. Yeah. Um, why don't you redirect everyone to the dub 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 domain, including those who have bookmarked the non dub 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 domain? Yeah, because then uh, the client says there's a problem with database fetching and the service worker uh, because it's uh, it it, it uh, shows these these corp errors. Right, um, but that means yeah. that this that this service worker or whatever it is that is making mm -hmm. these requests is requesting some, it, while being on the dub, dub, dub domain, request something on the non dub, dub, dub domain. Yes, yes. That's the root cause. You should fix the root cause. In that case, your service worker should use the dub, dub, dub domain to make fetches. And then you redirect okay. everything to the dub, dub, dub domain. So and if that's uh, uh, difficult from a technical point of, of, of view, I'm I, I, uh, not into it so deep, so uh, yeah. I can't. Yeah, would it be okay to only redirect the uh, uh, the users to the dub 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 and 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 uh, not the Google bot? I think that is okay, but to be honest, I think it's as much effort to do that than to fix the service worker making requests yeah. in the wrong domain. Okay. Um, I think I think the effort is pretty much the same. It's it's different people having to do this. I agree. Uh, it's very likely mm -hmm. that that someone. Uh, else makes the redirects versus the person who, who writes the service worker. But I would argue you can do it. I think it's fine. I don't see an inherent problem with it um, to do the redirect only for Googlebot. 
it might turn out to be tricky to test things later on and you might run into situations in the future where where it's harder to debug problems with this kind of setup um, because you are treating googlebot differently than normal users so i would recommend to fix the root mm -hmm. cause which is the service like redirect everyone to dub 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 and then make sure that the service worker does the thing it needs to do properly on the dub 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 domain rather than trying to make a request on the other domain um, this might be as simple as changing one constant or variable uh, somewhere in your in your scripts to actually use the correct domain. Um, but if you can't do that, then sure, a technical workaround is that. But I would consider that not a solution, but a workaround. Okay. Okay. Thank you. You're Great. welcome. Happy to help. Okay. Okay. And maybe if I um, uh, may ask my second uh, question. Um, sure. We have two. time. Okay, cool. Um, another client who has a, a homepage and um, a website, and before loading um, the main content, he shows um, uh, uh, content to collect uh, user consent for, for legal uh, issues, something like mm -hmm. that. And um, only if uh, the user consent is collected, the main uh, content is loaded. And this all takes place on the same URL. Um, mm -hmm. um, and the question would be, uh, would it be okay um, to not show Googlebot this legal uh, user consent page and, and immediately load the main content? So you treat Googlebot mm. differently uh, than the other users. Um, would that be uh, okay from an SEO point of view? I think that is fine. Uh, depending a little bit on our heuristics, we might false qualify this as cloaking, uh, which then might cause issues. But normally, normally, you would have to test mm -hmm. this. Uh, it should not be a problem. I advise a little bit against it. It's probably, um, unless there's li literally legal reasons not to load the content in the background and then just like make the user consent before it, there, there might actually be legal reasons uh, to not load content before someone has um, before someone has given consent to something. Um, in that case, yeah, that's fine. That's a workaround that I would say is OK. OK, and uh, you would consider this a low risk that something goes wrong? Uh, I would not consider it low risk. <laughs> OK, so um, we have to try. We have to test I, would, I would try that very carefully yeah. and, uh, and be ready okay. to roll that back if needs be. Yeah. OK, thank you very much. You're welcome. Um, Suzuki has a question. Suzuki-san, excuse me. Uh, this may not be related to JavaScript. Well, it kind of is probably related to JavaScript. How can I identify the largest content when my LCP is slow? And question two, how can I find what elements cause poor content layout shift, uh, cumulative layout shift? Uh, the LCP, that's a tricky one. I would probably use the web page test and look at the film strip. What is the largest blob where it like, basically is mostly white uh, or whatever the background color of your website is uh, to suddenly there is content. Whatever loads in that large blob is probably what's blocking the largest content full pane time. Very likely going to be images, but it could hypothetically also be text blocks. But it's more likely that these are images that, that uh, make your LCP time high. Um, for which elements cause poor CLS, uh, you can look at the requests and then block individual requests. You can either use a script that, uh, so if you are looking for, let me see if I can find this real quick. Um, Tobias Willmann wrote a script using Puppeteer for this, which I think is pretty cool. Um, haven't tried it out, so I don't know uh, how well that actually works. But I think Tobias is usually producing good stuff. So I wouldn't be surprised if this is actually pretty cool. I posted it in the, in the chat. Uh, there, and I'll, I'll make sure that I put it in the YouTube description as well. I'm, I might forget that. Let's face it. But I'll try to remember and put it in the YouTube description when this video goes up. Um, but basically, you can. I can probably show this. Maybe I can show this uh, on an example. Um, do I have a good example, though? where I load different pieces of content. Yeah, I think I do. We'll, we'll find out. Um, let's see, 50 lines of code. 
a blog, and then if I go, I'll share my screen with you in a second. Um, let's see, a Chrome tab, and I want to share this Chrome tab. So if I'm not sure what causes things here to go wrong, um, I can go into the network tab. I can load things. And then if I'm wondering, actually, let me get this uh, away here. And maybe I start with images. Um, there should be this one, for instance. I can say I want this URL to not actually be loaded. And then I can load again and see like if, if things are shifting or not. And you can see that this image has no longer been loaded. You can basically go through the different elements and then uh, run your your metrics to see if you are no hold on. This is where I wanted to go. You can run your metrics to see if that makes a difference or not. I think it respects request blocking. I hope. But anyway, there is a puppeteer script that does this for you, which is even nicer um, and gives you a better feeling for what's happening. But I'm pretty sure. Wow, why is Lighthouse warming up so long? Well, to be fair, my computer is acting up a little bit this week, so I'm not super surprised. Mm -hmm. um, not super sure what we are getting, but OK. Unfortunately, we, we don't get to see if the image was loaded or not. But I'm pretty sure if I basically now go and block pretty much every image, that we will end up getting a better score. So you can have a look at what requests make the biggest impact on your scores. Uh, oh, Lighthouse 6 gives you this info. That's awesome. I didn't know that, that we have that built in. Uh, Dave, thank you very much for following up on this one. Um, so yeah, PageSpeed Insights does that. Uh, Lighthouse 6 will roll out, I think, with the next Chrome release, probably. Uh, or you can install it from GitHub um, if you want to run that. That's pretty cool. And then it tells you which elements are affected. Anyone else with a question from the audience? We have a few questions on YouTube if no one from the audience has a question. All right, so I'm not sure I understand this question, but maybe some of you can help me with this. Uh, why would first contentful paint and uh, largest contentful paint be far apart in Lighthouse and PageSpeed Insights? The performance tab says they happen at the same time, and there's a real user. I see the whole page load at this, uh, all these elements at the same time. Well. It is possible that uh, with Lighthouse, I it runs on your computer unless you run it from web.dev slash measure. Uh, PageSpeed Insights runs from the cloud, so it might give you different data if that's the question. Also, first contentful paint and largest contentful paint do not necessarily have to happen at the same time, especially if you're um, on a device with slower CPU, then these can divert quite substantially. Uh, they might load at the same time on your on your device, but they might, as in like your computer, but it's li unlikely that this might take longer on a slower network connection or on a slower device with a slower CPU, like an older mobile phone. Um, that, that happens. How is largest contentful pane by type, page type determined? What does that mean? What page type? I don't fully understand the question because I'm not sure what you mean by page type. Um, the element seems to shift. Well, that has nothing to do with largest contentful paint. That would be CLS. That would be communicative layout shift. Uh, Jennifer, if you want to ask this question with a little more detail, um, next, next uh, in the in the next hangout, let me know, um, or basically just go to YouTube and and uh, put it in the next uh, hangout comments or in any of the next coming up hangout column uh, threads. Because I'm I'm not sure what you mean by page type, uh, largest content full paint. How it's determined is ex explained quite nicely on web.dev, but I'm not sure what you mean by page type. Um, then we have a sports betting website that streams sports games and data to end users. We use a JavaScript framework, Ember.js in this case. 
to render the sports book views. The page URL structure is mysite.com slash live sports hash football slash England slash competition ID slash match ID. Our customers want us to get rid of the hash sign and provide them with slash routes in order for Googlebot to crawl them and index them. However, when the match time comes and when the match ends, the URL returns a 404. Question, is there a real reason to remove the hash? Will Google index those temporary JavaScript routes? If yes, then what will happen if a few days after it, the, the page returns a 404 status? So generally, if you want these things indexed, you need to remove that hash. But if these URLs are short-lived, and by short-lived, I mean 90 minutes of a, of a match, then I don't see why you would do that, unless you do have them up, up front, and they are there for like a week or longer than, than a couple of days or minutes. Uh, then I think if you want people to find it before the match or while the match is running, then it makes sense to have these URLs present and rendering properly um, a couple of days beforehand before the match. Uh, it's fine for URLs to go for or for afterwards. Uh, what would happen is if you give us enough time to discover these URLs, and enough time can be a few days or even a week or so, um, because we might not crawl your page quite often, quite that often, or your site quite that often. Uh, but if we do discover them and crawl them, we would index them. Um, we can't do that if there's a hash in there. So people would not find this uh, while the match is running or before the match starts. Um, so if, if your, your customer is in, uh, or relies or wants people to find this content before the match or while the match is running, then you should definitely get rid of that hash uh, in the URL. Uh, and once you are returning a 404, even using JavaScript, you're returning a 404 um, because the match is over, that's fine. We'll eventually see that it's a 404 page and then remove it from the index again. So depends a little bit on what your customer wants and how your customer thinks about these URLs. Um, it's fine to have these temporary URLs indexed. Nothing wrong with that. Um, but if you want them indexed, you can't use a hash route. Can we somehow only use JavaScript to make a working comment form? Yeah. But with a comment form, I mean, that's a form that you use to enter comments. And you can totally use JavaScript to do that. I'm not sure I understand that question. Uh, if you have follow-up information, please for post a follow-up question in the next Hangouts. Um, right. That's it for the YouTube comments, I think. Let me reload the page, because sometimes people are commenting while the Hangouts is happening. No. Any more questions from the audience, then? Now is your time. I've got a quick one, Martin, if that's all right. Sure. Uh, can, uh, came across a couple of questions and stuff in the forums and that, where people are pre-rendering. Um, but they're kind of serving everything with the JavaScript uh, after the pre-render. So mm -hmm. they're kind of enacting, but leaving it in place. It's my understanding that's kind of missing some of the point of it. Are you better to remove that JavaScript? And does it particularly cause troubles if you do leave it in? Will Google try and then um, render the page anyway? Um, that's a good question. And I think if I think about this, so if I want to pre-render, 90% uh, of the time, probably people don't have to pre-render for Googlebot. They might want to pre-render for other bots that don't run JavaScript. But unless they have a technical reason that they should fix elsewhere, um, then using pre-rendering as a, as a workaround is kind of, it's a workaround. And if you are then not removing the JavaScript from the pre-rendered page, then you're kind of, yeah, you're kind of missing the point. Because then, sure, we do have the content in the initial HTML. But if your JavaScript kind of overrides it and overrides it incorrectly, then we might end up still seeing the incorrect con uh, like content or the missing content or whatever it is um, if your JavaScript just like overrides everything uh, and doesn't work properly. And if that's the reason that you pre-render in the first place. Um, I would suggest if you pre-render for Googlebot, 
because your JavaScript causes the content to be incorrect or missing or whatever. Uh, do test very, very carefully if your pre-render solution actually fixes the problem when the JavaScript remains on the page. If it doesn't, I would just fix the JavaScript and get rid of pre-rendering. Um, if it works, don't touch it. If it's not broken, don't fix it. Uh, it's fine. You can do it. I kind of feel like if your JavaScript renders fine in the first place, then pre-rendering is just a way to burn money because servers cost money, and, and pre-rendering usually takes server load. Uh, so I would say if you pre-render, the page should come out without JavaScript at the end. But if it works for you other way, otherwise, then fine by me. You do miss out on the benefits, though. Okay. Thank you, Matthew. Thank you for the question. Anyone else with questions? I see there's like a bit of Twitter chit chat. Duh. Oh, people are like oh, posting yeah. random stuff on Twitter. Uh, sorry, do we have a question? Yes, Martin. Awesome, Alvaro. <laughs> How are you? Great. Uh, I have a yeah. I have a quick one. Um, I'm. It's not probably related with JavaScript, but we're thinking about implementing FAQ schema markup in mm -hmm. some of our pages. And I'm wondering if that uh, it's going to uh, decrease a little bit the page speed of the website, uh, adding this uh, LAD JSON um, data inside the page. And also, if this is also a good practice, if you are trying to acquire customers for let's say uh, paying keywords, all the keywords that are bringing direct uh, sales, um, rather than informational or, or transactional queries. I don't know if if you got my my point. I got I got your point. So um, that's that's pretty it. Yeah. Thanks. Right. You're welcome. Uh, great question. So. FAQ markup is most helpful for informational queries, not really customer acquisition, um, especially because if you are too blatantly advertising your services or products as an answer to a non-product related question, it doesn't really have that much. FAQ is, is more a way to give people information around something that you offer quicker um, than having them to go to your website. Also, adding JSON-LD blocks uh, does not really impact page speed that much. Uh, it does add a few bytes to the website, but that's insignificant if you look at the amount of JavaScript that you usually ship, amount the Im of images that you usually ship. It's a small, small, small percentage, and it doesn't really make the browser uh, slower while parsing, because it basically parses the script, sees it's not a JavaScript, and kind of skips it. Um, cool. So I wouldn't worry too much about page speed implications. I think having FAQ data can help, especially for customer service related uh, informational queries. Um, mm -hmm. But I don't think it has much impact in terms of customer acquisition. But I might be wrong about that last part. Yeah, perfect. I agree. I agree with you, actually. Thank you. You're welcome. Awesome. Do we have other questions from the audience? No further questions? All right. So um, five, four, three, two, one. All right. In that case, thank you so much for watching. Thank you so much for posting questions on YouTube, joining this Hangout, and asking them live as well. Uh, I hope you have a fantastic day. Stay safe. Take care. Thanks for joining, and see you soon in the next JavaScript SEO office hours. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.